Hi, everyone. We're having a conversation today about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, this afternoon, we're going to get a perspective from uh, some of our colleagues and friends in South Korea. So we'll just go around and have everyone introduce yourselves and give us a little bit of background. Dr. Young Tae Kim, would you start? Hello, my name is Young Tae Kim from Seoul National University <laughs> Hospital in Seoul. I'm a thoracic surgeon. And I'm also in the charge of, in charge of uh, intensive care unit in, in my hospital, uh, basically located in the Seoul, uh, South Korea. Great. Dr. Ryu? Hi, uh, my name is Hogar Ryu. I'm a uh, anesthesia and critical care, also in Seoul National University Hospital. Currently, I've uh, volunteered to work in a makeshift 20-bed um, ICU in Daegu. Uh, which is the most hard hit area in Korea. Um, and I'm taking care of 15 um, ICU patients here. Great, and Dr. Samina Park? Hello, my name is Samina Park from same institution. I'm a, I'm a thoracic surgeon too. So I usually do the lung cancer surgery or mediastinum and also pediatric as well. Great. And Dr. Tony Kim. Hi, Chief of Thoracic Surgery at Keck School of Medicine at USC. Um, just anticipating uh, the tsunami that's about to hit us and wanted to um, get some pearls of wisdom from our colleagues. And um, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth David. I'm also a thoracic surgeon at Keck. And um, like many of us are looking for all sorts of learning points um, in this era. So um, to get us started, Dr. Ryu, can you give us a little sense of when the pandemic initially started? How did, was your practice initially involved? And were you, were you guys conducting cases normally or was there pretty much an immediate impact to normal business? I think that question might be answered better uh, by Dr. Kim. Yeah, I mean, uh... Usually, I mean, as, as you know, the pandemic in, in Korea started uh, next to the China. But at the time, first time at the beginning, we didn't recognize uh, what's going on because uh, it was started uh, mainly in Daegu City where Dr. Liu is now working. And, uh, and uh, at that time, there was a massive infection uh, among the pseudo-religious group, the Shincheonji we call, and uh, they have a special way of a workshop service. And uh, it seems that a couple of members of that church visited the Wuhan and got infected and uh, spread it all over the Daegu city. Because of the outbreak uh, took place main, mainly in that Daegu, and, uh, Daegu area, my hospital did not get affected much at the beginning. But however, because we have a painful experience from epidemic of MERS for several years ago, and we learned, at the time we learned how to cope with it and uh, in that it, academic situation. So CDC acted very early and the patients were allocated based on the protocol, disaster protocol we set up at the time. So uh, my hospital, from that point, we, my hospital started to get the patient. What were the conversations like about um, disrupting your elective clinical volume if those conversations occurred at all? I mean, uh, actually, because um, I think uh, mainly the problem is uh, where you are located at and uh, how is the situation of your, your local province. So, for example, in Tegu, most of the patients uh, should go to the in hospital if you are infected. So, and uh, if you are severely affected, you have to go to ICU. So, in Tegu area, or in a highly epidemic area, the hospital should change it to the, uh, to the uh, specific uh, facility to take care of those patients with infected with COVID-19. But uh, uh, the, where the area, like in Seoul, my hospital, where the uh, outbreak is not that high, but uh, still there is some patient coming up. We have a, a special IC, uh, isolated uh, bed available where we can take care of the patient uh, who, who are, are infected. And other than that, we've realized that there is many patients other than COVID-19 
who should be treated in Daegu area, but not able to access to the local hospital. So that's just the reason why we prepared our special unit where you can get the Daegu, uh, the patient from Daegu or Jungkook area. And uh, actually what we do is we do the screen those patients at first. And then if it is indicated, we do the RT-PCR test. If it is positive, we postpone uh, the treatment. And if it is urgent, we uh, and admit the patient to the special unit and uh, do the surgery in a negative pressure controlled uh, OR. Mm -hmm. But it's not that much in, in number wise. But the problem is, if uh, the test is negative, what would you like to do? And there is a chance to get uh, spread uh, all over the hospital. So we made a special unit for those uh, specific patients who are came from the high, high epidemic area, but uh, test negative patients. So in that way, we can uh, prevent cross-contamination uh, among, the, among the patients. And uh, we did a surgery. And uh, we used the uh, OR, uh, not the specialized OR, just the regular OR, but uh, we put the patient in the last case of the day. And if they are, they are sick enough, we transfer the patient to, we call disaster ICU and that uh, they recover and they go to the general disaster, general world. In that way, oh, we, you know, I mean, we did uh, our role as uh, to solve the patient, uh, to treat the patient who are not COVID, but a relatively urgent patient in, in, in Korea. It, did you have any uh, stringent criteria as to who became high and low risk or who you deemed high and low risk either for admission going to the OR, going to the ICUs, anything like that? Uh, yeah, we do have some vague, uh, vague criteria. Semina, can you explain about it a little bit? Elective surgery are going on the 70% compared to as usual. Still pretty high. Pretty high. Yeah, yeah I mean, the honey, I mean, the, we did, uh, we make the, uh, to make the specialized uh, unit we cut down the, our cases intentionally 30% at the beginning. In that way, we can may, I mean, have some enough number of uh, medical personnel. In, and they, they put, we put those pay, I mean, the nurses and our other resources to, to organize that institution, I mean, that, that unit. And then uh, we started with that 80, 70%, but what we, realized, what we realized is that People does not get any access to the uh, hospital, and because of the social distance, they try not to come to the uh, to the public or hospital even. So we found that the diagnosis of the uh, new cases are decreasing. So so I think uh, it takes about a, a less than one month to get normalized to 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 you in in terms of your practice. So it's kind of, it depends. I think it depends on the situation, but uh, that's the. Uh, the area where in Korea happened because we, I think we started to control the disease at this time. I just wanted to add that it was, uh, I think it was a graded response. We did not know what was gonna come. So the 30% that Dr. Kim mentioned is just um, trying to make capacity um, depending on what comes. We're, we're still not sure what's gonna happen. Um, <laughs> So it was all like um, a very uh, adaptive uh, response to what was going on and what was expected uh, from the government. So, so initially, did you guys have days where you had cut, cut down to 70% and you felt like you could have actually been doing more because you had fewer COVID patients than you were expecting? So we did not have that many COVID patients who required ICUs or who required the OR. It was just um, more of a personnel issue. If there is a COVID uh, patient um, in a separate ward that requires um, critical care, then we had to send down nurses from our regular ICU. So that's why we had to cut down on our ICU beds uh, because of the personnel, not just because of the number of COVID patients. So um, in the end, I think if there were more COVID-19 patients, we would have, have had a, a major problem in our um, everyday routine practice, and we would have to had cut down um, more of that. But 
that, as you know, that takes time because cutting down capacity of patients that we already have and discharging them, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take days and weeks to cut down even to 30% or, or 70%, whatever. Um, so it was just a number that we had, but I'm not sure if we actually went down to that patient, uh, that number. And luckily, we did not have to go down to that uh, number. You know, one of the things that we, uh, in sort of having that um, unknown in front of us is, in addition to the personnel issue, is the personal protective equipment issue. And sort of everyone's using that right now. How did your system or your hospital anticipate a, the need, but then also the, the rate at which you were going to use this equipment and then anticipate uh, uh, couple that with what the influx of patients was going to be. I'm sorry, because my computer is so old, so I uh, picked up. So. It's so, no problem. Dr. Lee, before you answer that question, can you just give us a little bit of introduction of yourself and your okay. practice? Okay. I'm Dr. Sangmin Lee. I'm from Seoul National Lips Hospital. And I'm working as a pulmonary intensivist and I'm in charge of medical ICU. So actually in our hospital, we have a daily COVID-19 meeting under the director's supervision. At that meeting, we assess the current status of epidemic and patient screening. We also evaluate uh, supply and demand of resources daily and prepare the counter plan at this meeting. Fortunately, our hospital had a state designated isolation bed, bed so we had pre-stocked resources. Well, so that's a, a big, big point. I mean, the, for the PPE, I mean, the, especially the uh, surgical mask and the, or N95 mask, the government uh, distributed, started to distribute to the hospital. I mean, so we get the uh, one mask a day for as a surgeon or as a medical person. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the general population, uh, they supply like uh, two masks you know, in a week. And uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 uh, testing, uh, as Semina told us, uh, oh, the patient go through the uh, screening clinic and uh, uh, there is a doctor over there, and they evaluate the patient. And uh, if the patient has a high risk in terms of uh, symptom or fever or history, I mean they go through the uh, RT-PCR testing with uh, the charge of the uh, the charge. I mean the the government pays for that. But if uh, you have no symptom but still want to get tested, you have to pay for that. So in that way, we we manage it. But the number. Because the, uh, the, yeah, it's a huge number of the tests, so the doctors trying to cut down, cut it down a little as much as possible. 